Uh, welcome to tonight's session, Outsmarting the Bots, How to Get Your Resume Past the Applicant Tracking System. Uh, my name is Amanda Raymond, and I'm the Associate Director for Alumni Career Engagement at the UCLA Alumni Association. We're thrilled to have you join us today for this informative session. This session is going to be all about applicant tracking systems, breaking down how they work and the role they play in recruiting. From there, we will move on to strategies and tips on how to design a resume that is applicant tracking optimized. Then we will wrap up with some Q&A. Before we jump in, I do want to point out that the Alumni Association strives to bring you relevant and helpful career programming. So be sure to check out our resources and offerings at www.alumni.ucla.edu backslash careers. Also, be sure to connect with other Bruins on UCLA One, our online professional community where you can search for jobs, request informational interviews, and continue to build your Bruin network. You can sign up today at www.uclaone.com. So with that all being said, I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter, Joyce Yu. Joyce is a resume expert and career consultant with more than 14 years of experience in the industry. As a recruiter for Roth Staffing, one of the nation's largest staffing firms, she placed professionals in roles from entry level temp to executive level, uh, executive level leading uh, positions in top companies. She later worked for TMP Worldwide, a global digital recruiting technology and marketing firm collaborating with Fortune 500 companies to create solutions for their applicant tracking systems and hiring needs. Currently, she is working with professionals at all levels, writing resumes, cover letters, and LinkedIn profiles that are not only ATS optimized, but they also catch hiring managers' eyes. She also coaches and supports clients as they look to make a career transition. In addition to her work as a career coach and consultant, Joyce is an independent filmmaker, actor, and voiceover artist. Joyce graduated from UCLA in 2003 with a bachelor's degree in linguistics and anthropology. She also holds her MBA from Pepperdine University. So without further ado, please welcome Joyce Yu. Thank you, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm glad to be here and to be able to share with you guys some tips that I hope will make the job search process a little bit more manageable, demystify it a little bit. And tonight we're focusing on the applicant tracking system. So first of all, what is an ATS or applicant tracking system? It's essentially a software that captures candidate data through an online job application and stores it in a database that is searchable and sortable. It also automatically scans and scores your resume. So from the candidate point of view, and you may have seen this if you've applied for a job online, you may be asked to create an account and then to log in, upload your resume, and then fill out an online application. And sometimes those are quite long, uh, as I'm aware. And then from the company point of view, once uh, candidates have applied, they're able to go in and see all the candidates that have applied for a particular job and they can filter through them based on certain criteria. They can also take actions such as moving certain candidates to say the phone screen phase and such. The big challenge here for applicants is that if the system doesn't determine that your resume is a strong enough match for the position, your resume may actually never be seen by a person. The ATS is basically a doc blocker. And adding to this is that more and more large companies are using these systems as the first step in the hiring process. So I just want you guys to come up with a number in your head as to what percentage of large companies do you think are using an ATS? It's over 90%. It's nearly all of them. And when we say large companies, the reason is because it's typically um, the larger companies that are getting this high volume of applications and also that they have the budget to justify investing in a, a software system like an ATS. So how do you know what constitutes a large company? A very easy way is to look up the Fortune 500 list. Typically, these are gonna be the companies that are using 
these applicant tracking systems. Now, how do you know if you're dealing with an ATS? So a trick is, let's say you're on a company website. In this case, an example is Experian. So let's say you're on Experian.com, you go to their careers page, and you find a job that you like, and then when you click apply, if you look back in the search bar, you will notice that the uh, domain name actually changes. And in this case, it becomes Taleo.net. So Taleo is one of the largest and most popular ATS systems out there. And these are some of the, the others that would be good to become familiar with so that you recognize when you see that URL change. And just generally, I would recommend doing a search for top applicant tracking systems because sometimes new systems enter the market or certain systems become more popular than others. So it's just a good idea to become familiar with what the systems are and how to recognize them. So let's talk about how we can optimize your resume to be able to make it past the bots and hopefully get the attention of hiring managers. So we're gonna talk about five key strategies one at a time. They're keyword matching, formatting, section headings, weighting, and relevance. We're gonna start with keyword matching because that's kind of the crux and the core of how the ATSs work. So essentially, they look at the text of the resume and they look at the text of the job description and they look for certain keywords and phrases to see where you match. So this is a screen grab from a tool called JobScan, which simulates most of the the algorithms of the top um, applicant tracking system. So we've copied and pasted resume text on the left, copied and pasted the job description on the right. And both of these have the term product roadmap. So this is great for the resume. This works in favor, showing that resume as a match. However, what we're looking at right now in this particular screen is agile software development. So that is within the job description, but it is not in the resume. So that is something that works against. Now, how do you know what keywords you should be matching? So you wanna match key functional words in your resume as closely to the job posting as possible. And what do we mean by functional uh, keywords? We're talking about words that are related to the job or industry that are commonly used. In other words, terms that someone would likely search for when they're finding a candidate. So as an example, that previous job description contained the word nimbleness. Um, they were looking for someone with nimbleness in responding to change. Well, that's a really unusual and very uncommon term. It's also not related to any specific job or industry. So that's just an example of what kinds of words you can ignore. Now, a, a shortcut for how you figure out what job terms um, are important and needed, because a lot of you guys are gonna be new to the job market, you may not necessarily know all the terminology behind a certain job or a certain industry. So a, a great way to do that is to read through a lot of job descriptions, but that can become very tedious. So a shortcut is to create a word cloud, which is essentially a visualization. And what it does is any words that appear more frequently appear larger than words that appear less frequently. So there are a number of online tools for free. Uh, one that I like is called Word It Out. So you can copy and paste um, a bunch of job descriptions and enter them into the box, generate this visualization, and it will show you which words are commonly occurring. So in order to not skew those results, there are some things you wanna ignore. Um, job description words, things like experience, skills, ability, required, preferred. Um, these are not words that anyone's gonna be searching for in your resume. It's just very job description specific. Also company descriptions, um, benefits information and legal disclaimers. Often job descriptions will contain short paragraphs telling you a little bit about each. Now those last three are pretty easy to eliminate because they are in their own separate paragraphs. But the job description words are kind of sprinkled throughout and they're a little bit more tricky. Well, the worded out tool, you can actually go in after you've generated it, go into the word list and edit it so you can remove or hide any words that you don't want there. Some other things to pay attention to in terms of keyword matching. One is frequency. 
So if a word appears more often in the job description, you should also try to integrate it more frequently in your resume where it's applicable. And that's just the way that the algorithm is set up to where they want to see similar frequency of keywords. Another thing to pay attention to is verb tense. You really want to match the tense that is being used in the job description. Um, ATSs don't necessarily have an incredibly sophisticated uh, language system. I think we're used to something like a Google where if we type analyzed, it would also return results for analysis or analyst and all the different variations. Well, the ATSs are built by separate companies that don't necessarily have the resources or the technology to do that. And so they often look for exact matches. So if you had analyzed in your resume, but the job description says analyzing, you do want to find a way to convert that to analyzing. The caveat is you want to make sure you're still maintaining parallel structure in your resume. So in a resume, you want each bullet point to start with a verb. Um, if it's your current job, it's present tense verb. If it's previous jobs, it's past tense. So let's say you had written in your resume, analyzed usage metrics. Well, the job description says analyzing, so you might convert that to held responsibility for analyzing so that you can incorporate the tense, but also maintain that parallel structure. And then you also want to be aware of abbreviations and different variations or versions of certain terms. So if you're dealing with an acronym, you want to both write out and put the abbreviation. So as an example for your degree, you would both write out Bachelor of Arts and then also write BA. And that just covers your bases to make sure that you are matching with the job description. And even sometimes the job descriptions will use both. And then also there are certain phrases that are written a bunch of different ways, like Microsoft Office versus MS Office versus MS Office Suite. So in this case, just pay attention to what's in the job description and match the one that they use. Now for a key don't is keyword stuffing. So sometimes what people will do is they will type certain keywords or terms a bunch of times and then change it to white font to quote unquote hide them. What happens though is once your resume is imported into the ATS, all that formatting is taken away. So they can see that you've done this and they see that you're kind of ga gaming the system and this is a bit of a turnoff. So try to incorporate those keywords as naturally as possible throughout the text of your resume. Now let's talk about formatting and design. One of the key things is the file type. Usually once you get to the stage where you're asked to upload your resume, the ATS will specify what acceptable file types are. However, I will say that generally Word docs and docx are scanned much more easily than a PDF. Um, sometimes the ATS does have a difficult time parsing the information in PDF, so where possible, I would say use a Word doc. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, other elements here. So you also want to make sure that you're very consistent in how you format things. So all job titles should be formatted identically, all section headings formatted identically. And that's so that the system recognizes that it's the same type of element. And so it will categorize and group your uh, information appropriately. And then finally, you also want to use universal fonts. Stick to standard fonts that are compatible across most systems. If you would do a search for web safe fonts, that'll give you a list um, to start with that are generally good fonts to use. And so if you are following um, these guidelines using kind of the web safe fonts um, and using simplified formatting, then the Word doc should still read okay when it transfers from system to system. So let's talk about some things that you want to avoid or minimize in terms of design and formatting. The big thing is graphics and images. I think a lot of people wanting to stand out and capture attention um, want to have this really beautifully designed, uh, colorful resume. And a lot of times they will create sort of an infographic style resume where they visualize, for example, the amount of experience um, and things like that. The problem is that the ATS is only built to recognize text. And if you have a very heavily designed resume, that information is captured as an image and it's essentially blank to the ATS. 
And so it won't read any of that content. And actually when surveyed, most recruiters said that they preferred a more simplified and traditional format because it's easier and quicker for them to find the information that they need rather than having to figure out how to read this kind of newly designed resume. Another thing you want to avoid are text boxes. Again, ATSs just have a hard time reading these and oftentimes they don't understand what order to read them in. And so your information can get jumbled up, put in the wrong category. And so your information won't be read correctly. And then something to minimize uh, is columns and tables. I would say columns more so. And again, it's because it doesn't necessarily read the information in the order that you want it to. Sometimes people put the section headings in a separate column, like experience, education, and then they put all the information in a separate column. What happens though, it actually reads that incorrectly and, and doesn't put your information in the appropriate category. Tables are a little bit more okay, and I'll talk about where um, those are okay to use. So here are some things that are okay. If you want to add a little bit of color, a little bit of interest, um, I would say maybe using one to two colors, three max is okay. And the area where you have your name and contact info is generally gonna be the safest place to add design elements. And that's because they are not trying to compare your name and contact information with the job description, right? The rest of your resume, absolutely they are comparing, but the, the name and contact info obviously isn't going to match. And so that's not an area you need to worry about. So you can add a block of color, maybe a little bit of a pattern, something here. And then some other ways uh, or areas that you can add a bit of color are things like section headings. You can see here that they're done in that same teal as the header. Uh, maybe section dividers where you see these um, thin horizontal orange lines between each section. You might want to make that a color. You might think about doing the bullet points. And I mean, not the text, but the actual bullet uh, dot itself. And maybe you might consider job titles or company names. And if you're going to do that, I would do one or the other, not both. Now the table exception. This I think is absolutely fine to use in the areas of expertise or skills section because it organizes that information very nicely without taking up too much space. So you're not having to put them all on um, in one long column. And the trick here is to really minimize the number of cells. So in this case, this is three columns, one row. The more cells you start to add, the more confused the ATS gets about the order to read things in. So once you type in your first bullet point, just hit enter and that'll create a new line, but stay within the same cell. Some other things to be aware of are section headings. You want to use very standard common section headings like you see on the left. Um, the ones on the right are some examples that I have seen from clients I've worked with. Someone put career track instead of experience. Someone put academics instead of education, and someone put charitable work instead of volunteering. Well, the ATS is programmed to recognize pretty much just the standard headings. It's not gonna really understand that career track is meant to be experienced. So really stick to the basics here. Uh, the ATS also weights content differently. And so one of the key things here is that it weights hard skills more heavily than soft skills. Hard skills are gonna be your technical, job specific, things like programming, pro project management, social media marketing, and Adobe Photoshop. Generally any softwares are gonna be considered hard skills. And then your soft skills are personal qualities and people skills, things like leadership, consensus, consensus building, and adaptable. So just to be aware of maybe where to um, pay a little bit more attention to which keywords you are incorporating. And the other thing that the ATS does is it weights certain sections more heavily than others. So your most recent job title and description are going to be weighted the most heavily, followed by all your previous experience and newer experience is going to weight heavier than older experience, followed by education, and then basically all the rest of the section. So summary qualifications, areas of expertise, and so on. So given that your most recent job title and description weight so heavily, let's talk a little bit about 
how we can edit or modify job titles. Um, you want to match your title, if possible, as closely to the desired job title as possible, but without being misleading, right? So if the job title you're going for is one that you've never held, let's say it's at a lead level or senior level or something like that, um, or in a totally different industry, you don't want to match that because then you're being uh, misleading about that. But in a situation where you at least have some overlap where you can kind of make that transition. Um, a really easy one is when the word is pretty close. So if your title was content writer and the job you're applying for is content creator, go ahead and change it to content creator. It's close enough. Um, it's very similar. And then when the company runs a background check and verifies your employment, it's really unlikely they're going to quibble about you calling yourself creator versus writer. Um, a couple other examples is you may have seen this a lot is companies will put a really vague title and then a number like engineer one or analyst three. Well, what does that mean? So instead of putting that, I would just translate it to what it is. So maybe it's software engineer, maybe it's senior data analyst. Now I've had some cases where people have really strange job titles and it's a title that only that company uses, no other company uses it or would even recognize it. So what do you do in that case? So I had someone come to me and their title was intellectual property coordinator. And it turned out that was a product marketing role. And so the way we wrote it is exactly how you see here. So we put their actual title and then in parentheses, we put the functional title, the one that matched more with the job that they were going for. You can also do it in the reverse. So you would put that functional matching title first and then in parentheses, put your actual title. And which order you do it is really up to your preference. My thinking is if you put the functional title first for the person who reads it eventually, they very quickly and immediately see, oh yeah, this person is who I'm looking for. Some people feel like this is misleading. I don't think it is, but again, it is really up to your Kind of personal um, comfort and preference here. Um, also in terms of weighting, uh, repeating keywords and frequency, I mentioned before that if a word appears more in a job description, you want it to appear more in your resume. And we just talked about how important your most recent job title and description is. So you may think, okay, so if a word appears 17 times in the job description, I'm going to put that as many times as possible in my current job. Well, there's this other aspect of the ATS, ATS algorithm where if you use the same keyword in different jobs and different sections, it does add to the weighting. However, if you repeat the same keyword in the same job or same section, it doesn't add to the weighting. So it's okay if you do repeat it in the same section, if it makes sense, but don't feel like you have to cram it in a bunch of times because it won't actually help your weighting. Another thing to be aware of is relevance. So ATSs will often produce match percentages, sometimes by functional area. It will scan your resume, it'll pick up all the terms, um, and it will determine, oh, okay, this keyword is related to IT, this keyword is related to sales. And then it will kind of come up with a percentage overall from all the keywords used in your resume, where it will say, okay, this person appears to be about 35% IT, about 29% sales, 11% marketing, et cetera. So here you want to be careful about being very highly targeted because if you have a lot of keywords that are unrelated to your target job, it may actually decrease your match percentage to your desired role. And here's where I want to dispel a little bit of a myth about resumes or misconception is a lot of people approach them as being, it's supposed to be a comprehensive uh, summary or list of everything that I've done. Actually, you should think of your resume as a marketing document. It's meant to highlight the most relevant and interesting information to your target audience. So in this case, your target audience is the company you're applying for. What are they most interested in? And you wanna put more emphasis um, and space on your resume to those things that matter more to them and you can uh, devote less space to the things that maybe are irrelevant. So even if you had a job where, say, you um, 
managed inventory, but the job you're applying for doesn't require that at all, you can leave that out. Now, what if you have had just very diverse experience or you're changing careers? Um, so in this case, you would focus on what we call transferable skills. And those are skills that will transfer easily from one job to another. Jobs that are desirable in just about, or excuse me, skills that are desirable in just about any job um, or industry. And some examples are process improvements, training, data analysis, customer service presentation. So as you may have figured out from all these strategies that I'm talking through, you really have to tailor your resume. It's really not one and done where you have just one single version of your resume and use that for every job. So I would start with a master resume or resumes. So if you are say interested in both marketing jobs and administrative jobs, I would create a master for marketing jobs and then a master for administrative jobs because they are different enough keyword wise that you want to have separate ones. And then from there, you can kind of add, remove or edit content to align with each job that you're applying for. Um, the master resume may end up being longer than your final result because you do want it to be more comprehensive so that when you edit it, it does get down to one page. I would say for you guys as uh, students and recent grads, you really shouldn't need to go over one page. Once you've had, you know, maybe four or five years of experience under your belt, you can go to two pages, but at your level, really, there shouldn't be a need to go beyond one page. So here's a tip for making tailoring your resume a little bit easier, and that is building a modular resume where you actually write bullet points based on keywords and terms. So this is actually also a, an easy way to incorporate the keywords that you want to incorporate uh, because sometimes when you put them in the middle of a sentence, it might be a little bit more difficult and it's easier to modify to match the job description rather than having to rewrite your sentence to you know, match and then also maintain parallel structure. So here you can see every bullet starts with a key term that is in bold and then all the content following that describes kind of the experience and accomplishments within that area. And so when you build your resume like this, you can, when you go to tailor it to a specific job, all you have to do is reorder or delete certain bullet points. So this is a master in a resume that you submit, you wouldn't want to have this many bullets um, for a summary of qualifications. I would say, you know, five max. Um, and then also you can do the same structure for your job descriptions, write it, the bullet points based on the keywords. And again, here you would just either reorder or remove based on uh, the job that you're applying for. I do also want to note some strategies for writing for the human because in your quest to optimize for the ATS, we don't want to forget that a person is going to read it too. And there are certain things that are important to the person. So the order matters very much. So be thoughtful in how you order items. Put, most, put the most relevant and impressive keywords and bullets first, um, and then in descending order. And also incorporate those keywords naturally. You know, don't sacrifice readability just to stuff those keywords in there. A big thing here is highlighting accomplishments. Um, and that is specific contributions that you've made beyond just your kind of day-to-day -day responsibilities. Uh, this is a whole topic unto itself. I really urge you to look more into it um, because today is focused on the ATS. I'm not gonna be going super in depth, but here are just some examples on the left of maybe some contributions you can think about that you've made and where you can quantify them. When you are able to add hard numbers, it makes it feel more authentic and believable, it also makes you stand out. And this is one of the key ways that you can distinguish yourself because most people, when they write their resume, they just think in terms of what my responsibilities were, but they don't think about, okay, what was the impact, the benefit, the value of that? And, and they don't add numbers. So if you do this, you're head and shoulders above your competition. 
here are some sample accomplishment statements. And these are all examples from students and recent grads. So um, uncovered a $200,000 discrepancy due to underestimated labor costs while performing detailed cost analysis for a client, allowing the client to reconcile budgets. Commended for implementing processes that resulted in the highest efficiency the office had experienced. Created a marketing plan for a national nonprofit, which led to 10% cost reduction and 10% increase in sales. I wanna point out that the middle one doesn't actually have any numbers in it, but it has qualified the statement. It says in the highest efficiency the office had experienced. So in a situation where you can't come up with a hard number or can't remember, try to qualify it as much as possible to demonstrate why was this important? Why was it impressive? Why was it impactful? Or how did it benefit my coworkers and company? Another area that is very important for the human reader is the summary of qualifications. Now this is not weighted heavily by the ATS, but for the human, this is the first thing that they read. So this is typically a four to six line summary of your key skills, expertise, experience, et cetera. You can also choose to do a single sentence power statement. And that might be if you just don't have the space or if you just don't have enough experience to write out an entire summary. So I'll give you examples of each of them in a little bit. It is the first thing that they read. It should be the, at the top of your resume. And this is your chance to tell your story and emphasize the things you want to emphasize. Sometimes when people are reading your experience chronologically, it doesn't necessarily show you to be a great match. And so this summary or power statement is where you can point out the things that are most relevant to that role that you want. And objective statements are out. So don't use these. These are things like um, seeking a role in marketing where I can develop my skills. They're basically focused on what you as a candidate want, whereas the summary or the power statement focuses on what is important to the company. What qualities, experience, and expertise can you offer the company and how would it benefit them? So here's a sample summary, again, from a recent grad. Uh, passionate, tenacious, and self-motivated professional with a degree in music industry and hands-on experience in entertainment law, artist management, music production and marketing. Track record of taking initiative and leadership to improve collaboration and processes. Demonstrated success working effectively with artists, attorneys, executives, media, and venues. Creative thinker with well-developed analytical and organizational skills. And here are a couple of power statements. Diligent aerospace engineering student and intern with leadership skills and record of impactful contributions. Collaborative, quality-focused, process engineer candidate with chemical engineering degree and hands-on experience. And where a power statement would go would be just right there at the top of the page under contact information. And you don't need to put a header that reads power statement. With the summary of qualifications you do, you want to include that header, um, just like the headers for education, skills, experience, etc. And also, people like keywords too. So even if a company doesn't use an ATS, recruiters often manually perform keyword searches of resumes to match them against job descriptions using control F or command F. Because they're often dealing with a lot of open jobs and they're just not going to be experts on every single job. And so they often do have to refer back to the job description and then compare resumes to be able to see if it's a match. So matching keywords really helps you in any situation. And finally, I want to leave you with a resource um, to continue your understanding of ATSs, and that is jobscan.co. It's essentially built from algorithms that are used in those top applicant tracking systems. So it's a great tool to help you optimize your resume keywords to hopefully get more interviews. So with that, I'd love to open it up to some questions from you guys. Great, thank you, Joyce. That was very inform informative. Um, we have a number of questions. Um, I'm going to start off with um, someone asking about, and in the presentation, you mentioned that anytime you can quantify something, your accomplishments from a previous position, um, that's you know a good thing to do. But the student is saying they don't really remember 
exactly what the numbers were. Is there, you know, any kind of solution to that or what mm -hmm. do you and um, for that a student in that situation where they're not really clear on the numbers? Yeah, just be as descriptive as you possibly can be. So for example, if you don't remember the exact numbers, but you remember it was somewhere in the thousands or hundreds of thousands, then you can say, you know, saved hundreds of thousands of dollars or like a multi-million dollar budget or something like that. Or, um, you know, you can say something like, um, responded to a high volume of whatever, um, or uh, try, to, try to also put comparisons. If you can't put an exact number, how did you compare with your peers? So you might say, um, if you don't know the exact numbers, you might say um, secured highest volume of sales compared to peers or something to that effect. But just always try to describe that will help them see why it was kind of unique or how did you stand out in some kind of a way. Great. Okay. Um, and then the next question is uh, from a recent grad and they're asking if it's okay to include relevant coursework or projects. Um, and what are your thoughts about that in terms of the percentage of the resume that you focus on coursework and, you know, school projects? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say yes, uh, include it. And a couple of ways you can do that with the coursework. Um, a lot of that is about incorporating those keywords. So, you know, when you write your degree under it, you might want to just put a bullet and, and put relevant coursework colon and then list um, kind of the subjects that you've taken and again translate them to whatever it is so if the course is say you know anthropology 204 that means nothing to anybody right so what is that actually um, so that's a way to incorporate keywords um, absolutely you can include projects depending on how many you've done you can include it in that education section something that I've done with a lot of students and recent grads is in their experience section, because experience weights so heavily in the ATS, is we've created a job for your schooling, right? So the company is your school name, your title is engineering student, design student, whatever your major was or, or topic. And then um, one of the bullets might be um, developed, um, you know, understanding of, and then you'll list the topics and that's a very easy way to put in some of those keywords that they're looking for. And then other bullets will be devoted to specific projects. Um, and you really want to try to focus on those hands-on projects. Let's say you were actually building something or creating something in a software, or you had a um, client, uh, for example, that you, or even a, um, kind of a simulated client, but a real company, right? Let's say you're doing a project and you do your research on a real company. Um, then you can kind of talk about uh, that you created a, a plan for this company or created a, a whatever for this company. And that is a way to kind of um, include some of that more practical hands-on uh, stuff that you've done. Um, also kind of um, boost optimization for the ATS and also kind of add to the experience. Great. Um, this is a question uh, about how to present uh, when you're self-employed. How do you, you know, lay that out in your resume uh, without saying self-employed? Yeah. Put that as a company name. How do you handle that? Yeah. So if it's your own uh, company, for example, um, you just put the company name and then put a functional title. So instead of owner or whatnot, um, put something functional that is, you know, in line with the job that you're going for. So for example, maybe it's a marketing position that you want and you do do the marketing for your own company, then you can say um, marketing specialist or something to that degree. Um, or you can combine, you know, for example, marketing and operations, because as the business owner, I'm sure you're doing operations as well. So um, you can put that and then kind of describe your responsibilities. Um, if you are a freelancer, um, you can put as the company, you can say, um, if you operate under a specific company name, just put that. If not, you can say 
uh, multiple companies or multiple clients. And then for your title, um, you can say something to the effect of, uh, you know, design consultant or design contractor, something to that effect. Um, and then put the description. Um, we have a few questions about uh, when is the right time to start taking certain things off of your resume? Like specifically an example would be um, this alumni has three years of work experience uh, and now they're looking for a new job. Should they keep their internship that they had from freshman year on their resume? Like what, what's the advice on that? Mm -hmm. I think once you've had a few years under your belt, you don't need to keep it on. Um, you know, unless it is really relevant to the job that you're going after, whereas your more current experience is less relevant, I would only include things if they um, really add to um, showing you as a match for that position. So, and so once you've earned your degree, also I would remove um, high school stuff. Um, again, unless it is really directly relevant to the job you're applying for, and let's say your recent experience isn't as relevant. Okay, great. Uh, and then this is a student who's asking about foreign languages, um, and specifically, I think they're an international student, so um, listing their, um, their scores for their English scores. Do you, what's your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Any, with any language, listing your scores and, and um, incorporating that into your resume? Yeah, typically not. Um, that's not necessarily something that a lot of people are familiar with. Is They don't necessarily know what those scores mean or how to determine what is a good score or not. And also, you don't necessarily want to draw extra attention to things that employers might consider um, a drawback. So if anyone asks about it, um, that's something you can certainly provide. Um, but a lot of that will come out in your ability in writing the resume and the cover letter and also in communicating during the interview stages. Okay. There are a few questions about like making a judgment call of keeping sections or deleting sections. Um, specifically, a lot of students are wondering if they're applying to a position where their the job and their major don't really line up, mm -hmm. do they keep their major or do they kind of you know minimize that or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, with education, it is very standard to include your major. Um, what I would say is, if you have had coursework that is related to the job that you're going after, then again, using that bullet point under your education to put, you know, related coursework or relevant coursework and then highlighting those courses that, that do match up with the job that you're going after um, is helpful. But uh, also just, you know, if you have, if you've written your experience to where you can point out where you have um, relevant skills, um, I don't think they're going to be necessarily as concerned um, with the degree that's not exactly in line. And it also kind of depends on the field and the job. Certain jobs are very strict about their requirements, like you need a degree in this field. Others, not as much, they just want to see a degree. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of dependent on the, the job as well. Okay. And kind of building off of that in terms of listing education, your major, um, what are your recommendations in terms of listing trainings, seminars, and certificates that are related to the job? Where would you put that within the resume? Yeah, so you can actually create a separate section. Um, certifications is definitely a standard heading. Training is also a recognized heading. Um, and I would keep it fairly simple, just put kind of the titles, um, you don't necessarily have to go into a tremendous amount of detail unless within that job or industry there's certain training that is uh you know extremely relevant um let's say you did some training in uh efficiency or productivity or things like that you don't necessarily have um, a certification but you do have some training that might be appropriate to put in but just 
the title should really be enough. Um, and if it's kind of an obscure title that you can't tell what it is based on it, then you can just um, put a title that makes more sense. It doesn't have to be the exact title of the presentation, but um, just kind of the functional uh, portion of it. Okay, great. Um, and then we have the timeless question of, do you have any recommendations in terms of fonts? Is there fonts that um, the ATS prefers and th maybe fonts that we should avoid? Yeah, so um, I'll refer back to the web safe fonts. So if you do a search um, for web safe fonts, uh, it, you'll probably find very consistent lists across that. So it's going to be things like Arial, Times New Roman, Calibri, Courier New, stuff like that. Okay, great. And there have been a few questions about design. Um, so, you know, a lot of people like to make their resume look a little more attractive uh, opposed to just, you know, the traditional black and white plain. Um, I know you discussed this in the presentation, but do you have any recommendations, specifically a student who is kind of going into um, a design type of career? Right. How do you kind of manage that or any recommendations for someone who is looking to enter that like creative fields, mm -hmm. balancing ATS versus being creative? Yeah. So, you know, if you are just say emailing your resume to somebody or printing it out and presenting to someone in person, absolutely. You can have this beautiful go all out designed resume. And that's part of knowing, uh, when you're dealing with an ATS or not, which is why I put in some of those tips to figure out if you are. And still the majority of jobs are found um, through networking, through referrals. Um, I mean, there are a ton of jobs online, but actually there's still a great many that aren't. And so um, in some cases you may not be dealing with the ATS at all. What I would say is if you know you are dealing with an ATS, use that traditional format and then at the top, um, with your contact information, you can include links, say if you have a portfolio um, or a LinkedIn. And so I would say to really call it out, you might um, put a link to a quote unquote visual resume. And then if you do have a, a nicely designed resume online somewhere, you can link it um, to that. Or if you have a portfolio, that should really demonstrate your design ability. So if you include your portfolio, um, that should do that for you. Great. Um, another question that we have is, any recommendations about including icons for social media? So a lot of students are kind of adding, in terms of their design, mm -hmm. putting icons for social media like LinkedIn on the resume or would that just totally confuse an ATS? So I would say, you know, as long as um, you keep it, the icon separate from the actual text. So some people make that entire block an image, right? They put like a little phone icon and then they put their phone number and whatever, and that's all an image. So instead of doing that, you know, keep the little icon separate and then put the text as text, if that makes sense. Um, I would say that's maybe the one exception I think is okay to put images, because again, that, that name contact information field, generally it's not being compared to the job description. Okay. Um, and then we've had also a few students submit questions in advance to this um, session, but also now live, asking about how important it is to um, incorporate ATS keywords into your cover letter in LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Is that something that they should be focusing on or is this just a, a resume kind of thing that you should be worried about? So a LinkedIn profile won't be run through an ATS, but um, LinkedIn, because it is web-based, benefits from keywords too. It doesn't have the same kind of weighting algorithms and things like that, but you do still want to be aware of what the industry and job terms are and include them in your LinkedIn in as many areas. There's a skills section, there's the summary section, um, because when a lot of recruiters do go on LinkedIn and search for people. So when they're searching for people, they're often doing it by those functional words. And so if you have those keywords within your 
LinkedIn profile, there's a higher chance that you will be picked up by one of those recruiters. So keywords are still important. It's just not the same kind of algorithms um, or, or match percentages or things like that that you would find with an ATS. Um, the cover letter, some ATSs scan them. It's generally not um, looked at as much for comparison to the job description as your resume because a lot of times the cover letter um, talks a bit more about other things, maybe kind of your values or your personal approach and philosophy. And so it's just not going to be as scrutinized as the resume. Um, so I work with students obviously on a regular basis and many of them, it's very common that a student would be applying to a company for different positions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we had a question about how do you handle addressing, you know, you submit a tailored resume for a certain position and then you see another position within that same company and then you're kind of reworking your resume and your experience. Uh, any advice in, in that kind of situation? Sure. So, yeah, I think recruiters are fully aware, you know, how ATSs work and that more candidates are becoming savvy to this. Um, and, you know, they want to find good matches. So if um, you do match, you know, with a couple of different positions, just depending on what experience you em emphasize, that's fine. I think the problem runs into is if a certain candidate is submitting resumes to jobs that they have no business applying to. It just, they don't see at all where the connection is or the overlap is. Um, but if you do have a well-tailored resume and it matches up with a position, um, I think that's fine. And recruiters are aware that probably sometimes candidates um, do have varying skill sets and do have um, varying interests. But also I think the other thing too is if they see somebody apply for a bunch of wildly different jobs, it might create the impression that you don't know what you want. And so they might think, well, if they get into this job, what if they leave because they decide they don't like it um, kind of a thing. So yeah, I think as long as you're not applying to too many di like very different jobs and you are being um, tailored to the jobs that you're applying for, you should be okay. Um, and then turning back to LinkedIn, uh, there are some questions about what should they put as their title after they've graduated from UCLA. So I mean, it's very common for students to you know, say student at UCLA. So mm -hmm. um, this is obviously an alumna um, now. And how would they, what would you recommend? They're probably looking for a job mm -hmm. um, in between. What, what are your suggestions in terms of listing as their title? Yeah. So you can just put uh, maybe the functional area. So let's say it's um, communications. You can just put communications slash PR slash what have you. Um, you don't necessarily have to put um, a title, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be communications graduate or communications student or entry level communications. It can just be the function. Um, of it. Uh, a lot of people do this, even people that are well experienced. Um, they'll put something like, you know, engineering slash design slash whatever. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, generally adding candidate to the end of anything is a nice catch all, especially if you want recruiters to be very aware that you are open to new positions. Um, you can put that. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably the best way to go. Yeah, okay, and then we have a question uh, that's very common uh, about the personal interest section. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on it and how personal can you get? What are the things that, that should be included in that section? Yeah, um, so I think it's nice um, if you have the space um, to include hobbies or personal interests. I would say especially focus on an and put first the things that might have some kind of tie to either the company or industry or job that you're applying for. Um, but yeah, I think 
a lot of recruiters and hiring managers do like to see that someone is a person and a human being and sometimes having those interests there can provide that connection, that common ground. I would say um, stay away from things that might be potentially controversial, you know, political, religious affiliations, things like that, unless you are specifically applying to a faith-based organization or a political organization where, of course, that would be an asset. They want somebody who uh, shares those kind of um, similarities. Um, but yeah, I think if you have the space, um, absolutely feel free to add that. Um, I, I agree. I think with the personal interest, that's not like an ATS thing as much, but I think it yep. comes into play during like an interview. Mm -hmm. so something that like maybe with a small talk or connecting with um, a hiring committee or a hiring manager, that's where that can kind of benefit you, uh, opposed to being like ATS. Um, right. Yeah. And then, uh, so there are a few questions about people who are looking to transition. So they're in probably their, one of their entry level jobs and they're looking to maybe transition to a new career or just a different space. Mm -hmm. General tips. I know that's kind of a longer process, but <laughs> general tips in terms of how to position your resume. Um, if most of your experience isn't super aligned with a new Field that you're looking to get into? How do you? Mm -hmm. So it, it's something I mentioned earlier about transferable skills. It's the skills that you've used um, in a position that has overlap. You know, a lot of times, I mean, you know, great customer service is often desirable in any kind of a role or great communication. Um, you know, maybe uh, areas where you have um, made problem solving is a big one. That's kind of um, especially if you were able to identify an issue and then come up with a way to make something better. Um, and a lot of times people just think like, oh, well, I was just doing my job. I didn't do anything special. But if you sit down and think about it, um, you've probably done more than you think and, and have more experience that overlaps. And it's a lot about translating terms that are specific to your industry to make them more broad. So for example, if you were in the healthcare field, you guys deal with patients. Well, you might want to translate that to clients because essentially they are, right? They're your clients. Um, and same thing goes for a lot of military things, right? There's a lot of military specific terminology like soldiers, whereas you might want to translate that to personnel or teams or what have you. Um, yeah, it's, it's just really finding the connections and then choosing to devote more space to the things that you've done that are more relevant and then um, devoting less space to the things that aren't as relevant. And I think this will be our last question, um, but it's kind of building off of what we've just we're talking about, um, but this student has a lot of experience in one field and then has one job that's in the new field. So they're curious as to, you know, how much space should they give to the other jobs that really aren't related to the new field he's in compared to the job that he's in right now that's within the field and makes more sense and this probably matches up more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, advice would you have for someone in that situation? Yeah, you absolutely don't have to devote the same amount of space to every single job, especially if you've had a job that was fairly short or is irrelevant. Um, I've even put out resumes that have a single bullet for certain jobs because it's just not relevant. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely put more emphasis on the current job because that's what they're interested in. They, they want to see what makes sense and what is relevant. And then anything that you write about your past positions, you want it to be in some way interesting or relevant, right? So um, even if it, has, if it wasn't the same job, if you know, both your past jobs and your current job and the job that you want have had some element of say project management, then talk about project management in your past jobs. Yeah. Okay, great advice. Uh, well, that wraps up our session on how to outsmart the bots. Thank you, Joy, so much for sharing your expertise and uh, insider insights with our students and alumni. Uh, to learn more about upcoming programs, uh, please make sure to follow our social 
follow us on social media on Instagram at UCLA ACE, A-C-E, and on Facebook at UCLA Alumni C. So thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope you found it helpful and go Bruins.